this is the link to the repo and here we have the docker file okay right this docker file it's using the python image Yeah, why it's here official spark image is the base i think it's it's not the the spark it's the python one so then as soon as container started with python we install java we set the environment environment variables for java then we make sure that the python is there then we set up the volume mount output where it will probably save something also we copy everything uh, in this folder to container and then we installing PySpark as a python the question that we might have do we have the do we have the Spark UI for this one? Did anyone and try it? No, I haven't tried this. I do run on Databricks, but there is no Spark config here, how the clusters run. Because it's single machine. It, oh, you I mean, don't need to open. Yeah, because the question is, um, I, I think we can ask the chat GPT. Uh, Maybe just the PySpark library and maybe it doesn't have Spark UI because the key thing that we need is the, the we, we need the Spark UI. So, okay. Yeah, there should have been at least local configuration. Yeah, it tells then we start the PySpark shell. We should have have it. We can try. Um, here I already on my local auto I already starting to do the changes. I've added the, the version, another version of Spark, uh, trying to set up the cluster. And this cluster has two workers, or oh, three workers, one master and one history one. But then the history one is always failing for me. So that's why I didn't finish it. We can try this one. So if I copy this path, and trying to okay, this process was how to install Spark locally. Is the Docker file. So Docker built Spark local. So we built the image first using this Docker file. This volume or which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm not copying any like 
for example, I not copy this data set. So, but you, if you will use uh, my version that in GitHub main, uh, it will copy actually this and this to your cluster. So now mm, the next step is to So what is doing here? Probably port mapping. Yeah, the first one is port mapping, but this one, I think it's like mapping something. Uh, so we probably, for you it will work, for me it's not gonna work. Maybe I will just try. Hi everyone, Himan, can I just use Databricks community? I just was able to uh, do that. Yes, in Databricks, because it was my plan B, so you can check if in Databricks community you have Spark UI. Spark UI? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, I can check. So, yeah, I think uh, here we also have Spark UI. The, this link work inside uh, the Docker. Uh, but it's um, maybe because we did port forwarding. No, it's not working. Maybe I did 50. Yeah. So this command, um, dash p, so this is the port that exists inside container. And we did the same exercise with databases. So inside container, it tells us that web UI available on this port. And Ajan, you can try see. I think if you go to the, you start the cluster, and if you go into cluster config settings, you you can see it. Um, hopefully. So for me, I need. These into here for the yeah next time then it will copy everything together. Okay, so we that's your step number one. And just remind you, the the main idea of Spark is to process the data, so it's not it doesn't store in data, just the compute. It's like query engine, and also. The, we see there are two things. Then we start the PySpark. Uh, it creates the Spark context uh, with um, like alias SC. And Spark context also creates Spark session as a Spark. So this like active process. Because if I will check the program, um, So, okay, this is the this they create the new Spark session, for example. And here, yeah, this. So, okay, let's do go to the article. Yes, I can see Spark UI. Spark yeah. Yes. So also there is Spark Compute UI Master. Which one? Just Spark UI? Yeah, I think uh yeah. So data breaks um unity edition. Oh it says it's not available for clusters in the pending state. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't uh, you need to probably start the cluster. Oh I... pending it is still in the process. Okay. To start. Thank you. Okay. So we can try to in both places. Because what is Databricks? Databricks, it's managed Spark, but the idea that it give us interface uh, and we don't need to decide how we're going to set up and provision the clusters and nodes, everything. And we have nice UI to work and write the code and the notebooks. Yeah, 
So if I go to compute, I will create cluster here. So right now in container, we I have the running cluster and it, now I can create it here. So I can choose the runtime. It's basically the version of Spark. Uh, so, uh, and the community edition give us free 15 gigabyte of memory. So, and we can create compute. So as soon as it will create, you see it has all the same, but very convenient. So we can use the create notebooks, write the code and attach. Uh, we can add, for example, if you want to add any libraries, even Python libraries that not exist by default in Spark, this here we can upload them. So we can see event logs. This is more about the cluster is created or it's fail, it couldn't create or it's scale up or scale down. This will be the Spark UI. This will be the logs. And there's traditional Linux logs like standard output, standard error, and log4g. So this is this is just how the like cluster works, like metrics, Spark UI map. Yeah, we will check this as well. So maybe you, you can also go and create um Spark um, Databricks community edition. So next, I go to this article. Uh, this guy, Safin Assad, I don't know him, but I like the idea that he focused on Spark UI. And very often you even don't need to do anything uh, with uh, Spark UI at all, except you you have the failure of your pipeline. And then you, and it's common question during the interview, Okay, you have the pipeline that failed. What are you gonna do? So the the answer usually you need to go in Spark UI, find the failed job, and see what operations it has. So yeah, we can you, you can read uh, as well. There is official uh, documentation for Spark UI. So, and it's explaining what each tab means. And this is this is DAC, like similar to Airflow DAC or DBT DAC, right? That dependency of the jobs. And because Spark is a usually distributed computing, it means it can run and execute task in parallel. So, and then they suggest to run the code. So this kind of code. So this program, uh, what they doing? They create, okay, this, they create the Spark session. And see the cluster as well. This one, yeah, the local. Mm -hmm. You mean what line? Uh, the line 13. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then, so they they have the, they create data frame out of these, I don't know, in, in the Python, is it the data set structure? This is dictionary. Oh, and dictionary. Uh, basically declares it is, Diction. I oh, know it's an array of tuples, I think, and plus the the uh, names, list. number, and letter. List of tuples. Yeah. Array. Yeah. List. Yeah. And then, so it's um, and this I think they pass the schema or like the the column yeah. names. So what I'm curious about, if I skip all those steps to creating the sessions and everything, and um, I will just execute this first. So, because in my UI, it's already tell me. Oh, it's not gonna work. Okay. So it it tells me that um, it has Spark context and Spark uh, session. So then I will. Oh. 
okay uh we create the test data frame and maybe so if you don't know what's data frame in very simple language it's like table so if in, in database like in snowflake everywhere we have the tables with records rows and columns in uh, spark same as the pandas we operate against data frames so it's the data structure that it's basically just the metadata on top of the data so right now this is um not the file it's it's like inside memory in cache but data frame just it's like abstraction on top of the data for example if you would have the file csv file and create data frame it means the spark holds in memory the structure of the file it knows the file the schema everything but it's not touching the file it's not reading the file so for example i can uh, test the f show just to see what i get oh, uh, that's wrong. and it's returning so it show me so it means we i don't even need all of these this would be important for example if you want to create spark spark program or spark application and spark program or spark application it means sometimes during interview they can tell you can you create this part application our program to do the following task and submit us result so it means you will create the file like the python file and it means you can use the spark submit from terminal you say this is my spark job spark submit and path to the spark job and it will execute the file then it's important inside file to t tell that declare that you create the session the spark context and everything to run this program as a, like as a part of spark submit but in our case because we work in the interactive ways same as it, you can do in the notebook so if i go here and uh, create new notebook so the first thing uh and it's similar to jupyter notebook the first thing we're going to do i uh, will connect to the cluster and now same i can run it and it tells me it's create the data frame and I can do the same. And also Spark has two types of operations. There is actions and who remember the second one? The actions and it's like lazy evaluation. So actions, then it's actually reading the data versus another one. No? Sorry? Transformations? Did... Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe transformations. Um, let's just check. Yeah, transformations. So there are white transformations and narrow transformations as well. So the white, which are doing shuffling and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, it means you you operate on met data frame, and data frame is a kind of like metadata. So you operate in the Snowflake or like in data warehouse, your data frame metadata is your table definition, your DDL. So and then for example, you can take your metadata from one table reshape it change and like save another one but also it th this example can include uh, any like transformations like you can add new column you can do some something but you you will do this without reading the actual date but the action this is what you can see that will consume resources is actually doing something then we tell do show command it actually process the data uh, Yeah, and they also here talk about logical plan, the optimized logical plan, the physical plan. Okay, so now I will do, so here we see that we have completed two jobs uh, and we have job stages and stages consist from, if I click here, so here we can see also input how many data was read so we can come to here 
And so the job consists from stages. Stage consists from tasks. And task is unit of work. And we also have the, it, it's a kind of like query plan, what actually was happened. So RDD, this is low level like structure because how the Spark works under hood. And it's doing a bunch of things. And if we do here the same, I don't know why it takes so long. So, and then I can go to compute tab. And now I can go Spark UI. I have similar. And it's, uh, I don't know, it has three jobs. I don't know why. Stages. How many nodes do you have? Uh, only one, because it's. Uh, I actually I don't know. I assume it's one because it doesn't tell me. It has two cores. No, not because of that. Yeah, course, I thought... It looks like single node because usually you have the worker, worker and master node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, standard output. Even you can see some metrics. What's happening here? Oh, standard output. In case of error, we can see anything here. And this is it's even brand new one already. Some errors log for change not critical okay back to article um yeah we did show command and also he, he here he's adding uh with column it's like adding new column we adding new column uh, and then we do grouping and then we do aggregation and then we show result Okay. I it's think like uh, we need to import it. Yeah. Yeah, I need to import this. And I need to import this. Okay, so now we have mod one zero and we group it's like even and not even basically and we group them. Okay. Oh and here also using PyCharm ID, so same as the visual code, and he just running the PySpark library so this is what he has he mentioned about the port if it's busy we can try another one yeah only complete jobs we can see So event timeline, okay. Where is event timeline? Oh, I have quite different.
Okay, it's basically tells how long each operation took. We have executors jobs. There's the stages, so it it will show input data size, and this is um, very frequently important because sometimes uh, in production, and this is also important for interview. Sometimes in production, you can get the question: Okay, you have the jobs that running every hour successfully, but to the last hour it was failed. How you will troubleshoot this? And very often you will start from this, from input. So if you can take one successful job and one failed job, what you want to compare, okay, the cluster is the same, all the same. You assume the size of input is the same. So that's why you need to find and see how much data is input. Like maybe you have way more data. And usually this is the case. You have way, way more data. Okay, so select stage two to show details of this stage. Um, I have, I have only one. Oh, and I think the reason why I think I know the reason why I have very different example because every my submission to terminal is a individual job and in in his case he submit the whole file so he basically what he did he create he put this file into container and then execute it So maybe what I can do here, I put all together. And we'll submit it as a one job. To do it here, um, I don't think, yeah, it's not, it's not working. It, I need, I would need to, Create the file here, like say similar. I have similar. I have here, for example, this this very simple example, very same same example. So I have the Python file, and then I can execute this Python file through terminal. Uh, if I do exit here, it's exit the container. If I do this, it's still still opening. Whenever I... uh, I'm sorry, Dima. Uh, I just missed the part. Why we're running all the code as in one job? Only to to match uh, his uh, query plan. Oh, okay. Because for us, we we split it as a individual jobs, and that as a result, our our result not match. That's what's my okay. So that's why here I just was explaining that here we can create the file and then we would need to change how we connect the Docker. So we connect the Docker bash and then we can try to submit. So because it will require some changes that I not not ready to do. So here we will copy the assume everything and then we can connect the container as a bash in the maybe another tab and then submit this file and then we can see it. So to not doing this in ID, I will run it here. All is all together. Okay, and then it's sleeping for a long time. Interesting.
even here it's actually submitting like free jobs and this is something honestly i'm i'm not sure how this works why it's um it's probably divide somehow they maybe have difference That's why it's important to understand um, the difference between jobs, stages, and tasks. Maybe. Okay. Maybe everything I said before, not right. So the job is anything that trigger actions, like count, collect, show, save. And then as soon as you ha get the job, it break by stages. And each stage divided by task. That's the thing. Maybe that's why. I have multiple operations. It has four, four tasks, but not clear what they're doing. It's even very hard to translate this into what actually happened. Okay, in his example, he tells that So on one hand, it tells you simple information, like how long it takes and what actually was done. On the other hand, it's hard to, to read. There is also metrics that helps you to track the performance, especially then you analyze the performance of the job. So garbage collections, because it's Spark built on top of Java, and I think garbage collections is some, some term inside the Java. Input and shuffle times and some elapsed times. For example, here we can see yeah, input size, durations, GC type shuffle rights. So one term you need to know is a data skew. So especially if you have multiple nodes and they reading the data and this data might have some issues, challenges, whatever, uh, because it's storing like you can have like big si size of files, small size of files, and just works not evenly, then you have data skew. So probably here you can identify this.
So in this example of the tasks, So SQL data frame view. What is doing? Oh, my. I'm restarting. So this, for example, the query plan. So it's scanning, or maybe, I don't know, maybe start from here, scanning the data from memory and project and collect result. Here we can see every Spark cluster, they have lots of different parameters by default, but they could be modified. That was like Java parameters. This is a very hard thing. So you see, it's, for me, for example, it's very hard. To read this part here and i never i never use it only use it if it's, it's failed then are trying to clicking around to find job usually if something failed you will see it and you can click around and see logs and trying to read why it fails sql query view of this first action well, maybe they have just two actions this is one action this is another action and this is the query plan. Okay, then they move to, okay. Move to the second one. And for me, it's different. One of the way to improve performance in Spark, for example, if you're reading files from data lake, you can cache. Uh, you can you can cache your data frame because it means it will put in memory. For example, some small dimension tables you can cache it. Also, this could be question on the interview about uh, what things you can do to improve performance. Yeah, that's those are completely not user friendly. This example, he, he went to, well, they, yeah, this article, how to create two nodes per cluster with Docker Compose. And someone wrote it. And this is, They built just the image because if if you look to Docker uh, Spark cluster that consists from multiple nodes, uh, each node 
will will be the same. So the same Spark. They just have the different purpose. Um, and we can see what they have. So they have, this is the Docker file. And here they're using uh, Java, not the Python, but Java as a source. This is just example of the Spark container. And then they're using Docker Compose to create multiple Spark uh, containers using the same Docker files, but just different name, different name, different purpose. And the nice thing about Databricks that you don't need to plan. You just go in UI and create configuration that you want. You can start small, like small cluster with a couple nodes, and then you can increase cluster up or increase like number of nodes, scale out. So here, this. So assuming they have these, they have Spark cluster with work two workers, one master. Then they have the job, the different job that they're running on the cluster. Yeah, they're using this Spark submit command, like this one. On the if you go to Spark container, like SSH to it, or like just connect, uh, you can submit. Uh, here they specified like deploy mode, master spark, even configurations. I don't know what does it mean. And eventually the Python file with the job. And then they go to the logs and spark UI to see what's happening. So again, they come to the jobs, they see the the jobs. Then they choose one stage. So the shuffle read and shuffle write. I know the shuffle operation is very expensive because if it means you have a couple workers and they're starting exchanging the data over the network. And speed network usually slower than, for example, any in-memory compute operation. That's why. The shuffle is very expensive. And for any data warehouse or distributive system, then you have multiple nodes. The challenge uh, is to avoid the shuffling operation because you're just using the network and you need to read and write and send and it's, it's expensive and, and long. Okay, they have these logs. So here they change um, execution sp uh, uh, Spark parameters, then they run. So it tells how much memory for executor. And this is very hard like to, because often for all those systems, especially open sources, like any Apache systems, you have different configurations. Uh, well, okay, you know your machine size, number of, CPUs or operation memory, and then you need to set different parameters that like, you know, 80% of your machine operation memory. And if you have this number of CPUs, then you can use this number of parallel tasks. And so it, this is not easy. And this, they check the environment, executors, executor memory, max failures. Then they started and job is failing. And then they basically trying to show if the job failing, what they doing here.
then they're trying to identify data skill. And then they mention adaptive query execution. This is the feature that probably helped to adjust the query plan and identify data skew. So to answer what is data skew, it's very simple. Imagine you have um, just database uh, engine like Redshift and you have four nodes. You have big table, maybe one billion of records. And uh, you then you will store this data into your data warehouse. Ideally, you want that each node will, will get quarter, like 25% of data. And this is evenly. And then you query your data. All four nodes should scan the data accurate and like work in parallel. But sometimes you might, if you don't choose the right distribution key, or you, you might save like, 90% of data on one machine and split the rest 10% between three machines. And it means uh, that the first node do all the job while other three is resting. It calls data skew. So, and it's applicable for all distributed systems including Spark. So, conclusion. Yeah, I don't think we learn a lot here except where is Spark UI and how to start it uh, from local or Databricks Community Edition. And this is something yeah, that you might to learn more. Also, there is one more service that calls Ganglia. Ganglia is there, oh, they don't have example. Uh, do we have it? Yeah, usually the metrics they hide it so people are confused. I think they have different tab right now. Is it metrics? Um maybe actually metrics is good. It actually shows how many clusters you're using. Like if you have multi-node and stuff, it can tell you. And it shows the how much processor is loaded. Maybe that one is simplified ganglia. probably need to do some sort of, usually I'll, I'll look metrics in the database jobs, like workflows once something is executed, pretty helpful. This is Ganglia, this one. So it, it shows you like a CPU, load, memory, input, outputs, all kinds of things. This is, Oh, this is the metrics. So I think they just took the same ganglia thing and like built internally. You see the same. So if this one, we have CPU utilization, memory. So here, what is it? Yeah, here they have just nice friendly interface for the same. Because this one, it's even not uh, interactive. This is like screenshot way. So you open it and it generates the snapshot for you. And you you just like PDF. It's not changing. So if you want to change it, you need to refresh it. Yeah, and this is the they probably do the metrics, you see, like different kinds of modern charts and updates. Um there is the book. Uh -huh. They have uh, the chapter. Yeah, this one. Optimization tuning Spark. So that's uh, I would suggest to start from this. So as soon as you understand what Spark is doing, how to create pipeline, then the next thing for introduce you need to understand better this. So tuning Spark for efficiency. So they always have examples in Scala. Uh, they don't. They should have sometimes in Python here. I think. They do. They do have actually. There is some some chapters they do sometimes they don't have. But so and here they're using the same like environment. Uh, they have um, 
you can pass the parameters scale well, this is the most probably important for the large large workloads uh, and uh, static versus dynamic resource allocation configures for executors memory and shuffle service parameters yeah parallelism is very important for distributed systems so if you have multiple of them how they will read the partitions or that's maybe interesting how the partitions created mm. shuffle partitions caching uh, this is the method of like how you can boost your performance sometimes like if you can some of your data frames transformation cache I can persist. Actually, in your example code, he cached the data frame. Uh, in what example? In the article. In the article, he did cache before displaying data. Okay. So when he created, yeah, 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 he did use cache. Yeah. So and then we have, oh uh, yeah, store. Which also they cover the storage tab. Uh, that's like our DD is a uh, data blocks. when to cache and persist yeah that's good when not cache also good park joints yeah that's i think this is the most important type of the joints it's the same as a snowflake like redshift you always have joints and they have different types of joints because you have distributed systems right the data should be joined and then you need to know what means each joint actually i wanted to add something so right now when databricks has a serverless it actually when you when when the person who actually doesn't know how to well optimize their job the serverless comes really handy because it does really everything for you and it runs so much faster is just uh, in the blink of an eye sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably yeah. very cost efficient. Yeah, and uh, basically the interesting part is that so now only Databricks charges you, so you don't incur any sort of cloud computing costs because the clusters are running on a data Databricks side, so it's a bit more transparent as well. So it's mm -hmm. easier to I understand how much does it cost. Um, yeah, so just to wrap, our discussion. So the broadcast has joined. It can copy automatically small data set uh, to like among all nodes. Then shuffle, sort, merge, join to, to merge two large data sets. If they sortable, unique. Um, optimize the shop so i think this this is um important to understand if you work with spark as a data engineer inspecting spark ui yeah that's the same what we tried to do today sql different tabs their purpose and summary yeah i think that that's it so it is, a question yeah uh, how in the world of in the word world of spark uh, as a data engineer you get away without like you get away doing your job without actually knowing how everything in spark works is just using heavy cluster that's how most of the tasks you have you resolve if something you know out of out of memory spills and out of memory errors memory spills all of that stuff like the job takes long time to just increase the cluster or you still actually you know try to google and do all of this manipulations to better make the processing. Yeah, I think uh, you, uh, in my expectations, uh, honestly, you you need, need this more often for interview. Okay. Yeah. Like to answer the question then for actual building, especially if you build on the data bricks, you always can compensate lack of design with size of the cluster, or you, you mentioned the serverless. That's how it yeah. goes. But if you build like on, on HDFS and Hadoop on premise, 
that's probably way more important. Yeah, but uh, you, you need to know at least basics because the question is how you will optimize the jobs and something like this, you, yeah, you might get during the interview. All right. Because interesting, many people still run uh, even Databricks exist in all clouds, but I hear a lot in GCP, well, in this EMR, EMR still runs on the custom configurations, right? And interesting why they're actually still doing that just because migration is hard. Uh, I think they have many problems. The migration is expensive. They're, they have like their compliance and privacy and security restrictions mm -hmm. for using the cloud. Yeah, there are, there are many reasons. Okay, makes sense. It sounds like in many occasions, how they say if something old and ugly, you don't, don't touch it, just make it, keep it work as it used to be. It doesn't matter how ugly or complicated it is, just, you know, it still works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And maybe, Sergey, you, I know you work a lot with um, Databricks. Maybe you can do something better than myself for the same topic. I don't think so. <laughs> I, uh, we don't, as I said, I'm, I'm interested in a topic, but for example, as I t I'll tell you an example. So we do have a, something that we can optimize, but then even from cost perspective, my manager says, so you're going to spend like two days right now optimizing something. And this process is going to be discontinued maybe in half a year. And she said, well, we're going to save like $3, like $2 per run. And then, but your, your day is worth of like 500, 600 bucks. So actually in end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much you optimize it because they're not going to really save us any money. So yeah. and we basically take that approach as for now, because we don't have jobs that run like hours. Maybe that's the reason why we don't need to optimize anything. So we do increase the cluster and then call it a day, because mm -hmm. I think even if you has expertise, your manager doesn't have expertise. So you start doing something and, uh, you know, in the end of the day, it's, if something goes wrong with your configuration, somebody has to troubleshoot it and if there is no expertise. So I think from management perspective, it's time wasted. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, that, that's fair. But when you come to interview, they will ask yeah. for you. <laughs> All involving Databricks, I got the questions about uh, performance optimizations and if job is failed, how I gonna do and troubleshoot it and what the reasons of the failure out of the memory and how to make it better and what's like general uh, perspective on the good design. So if you answer, you know, you know it's not worth the money, I'm going to use serverless. The answer is valid, but you not get the job. Yeah, and you know what, that's my biggest, not like a fear, but I, I do work a lot with Databricks and I know a lot there, but that's why I'm thinking if I go to maybe senior roles as well, well senior um, job interviews and technical interviews, I'm not afraid of, you know, designing and th things questions, but when it comes to job optimization, I, I don't have much to say, probably I just need to uh, speak more intelligently about that and a bit more words that actually, well, I can describe things, but I, I, I don't have that experience. I'm like, that would be really dumb if I need to, you know, pass the interview with something that I'm not going to be even using, even though I can really in Databricks do a lot. So, so that's why I, I think I, I do need to, if I want to go to interview, I do need to study just to, you know, have a professional conversation about this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say, yeah. I, I agree on that. Okay. See you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dima. Thank you.